Alright everybody, welcome back to the final match of day one here at the 2024 BC Open Snooker Championship. It's going to be a beauty to finish the day. Ross Bradson and Albert Lamb, two strong players. And I'm joined again by David Putty in the booth. It's David Burney here. Let's finish off this day with some fun. And good evening everyone. This should be, uh, by, by report, this should be a good match. So I'm looking forward to this one. It's a good break off to start anyway. And we have Hannah Lisovenko as the referee. Her daughter was playing earlier against Albert Kenny. So it's a family affair over here in Richmond, British Columbia. Kind of surprised that the Bradson army is not around, but maybe Kim is tuning in to see what hubby can do tonight. That's not uh, quite the start that uh, Ross would have liked. Made a, a good attempt at a, at a long ball and uh, it went awry. Yeah, Ross in the past year, he's playing a, a little bit more pool and obviously work he's telling me has been quite busy. So he hasn't been able to get out uh, on the stuckering table too much. Going for a two rail hit into the back of the pack by the looks of it. Is it hard enough? Not quite, I don't think. Perfect, perfect line, just not quite enough speed. Yeah, I'm pretty sure uh, our friend uh, Dave Daly is going to be tuned into this match because if Ross can upset Albert, that means Dave will be moving on. Dave has a 2-0 standings record right now. And Albert's 1-0 and Ross is 0-1. So, so if, uh, if Albert is to win, Dave, does it go down to number of frame or number of points? And it's match wins. So then, say that's going to set up a nice, wonderful match tomorrow between Dave and Albert because they'll both be two and zero. Oh. And then say if that was if they weren't playing each other, but then they were tied in the standings, both two and one, then we would go to how those two fared head to head. So yeah. the head to head would be the tiebreaker. And the odd case of a three-way tie, but I don't think we can get there. Uh, we'd have a blue ball off the spot tiebreaker, which we had oh, last okay. year, and it drew a lot of attention in the room. <laughs> it was fun to see. We actually pivoted our cameras over as well to take a look at it. But I think there's going to be a lot of exciting matches. Both John Shoring and CCU are both ahead of their group, tied at 2 nothing, And they're going to battle each other at, I believe, when is their match? I think it's high noon tomorrow. <laughs> well, high noon in the west, that is. <laughs> in the west, yeah. <laughs> Getting close to tea time in the east. This should be the first uh, pot of the game. And it is nice to play. Yeah, as much as Ross thinks it's a fool's game, he's trying to play with people saying he hasn't played at all. But he's been around the game for so many years that I'm pretty sure form will come quickly back to him. In a best of three format is obviously very difficult to play. If you're uh, trying to find your game. It takes you a game to warm up or get back into it. But. Yeah, 
Uh, we just had a, a report for the floor that our friend Blair Major not feeling too well, so kind of had to pull out of his last match. So I wonder if that was the case a little earlier on when he was playing Dennis. Just maybe he wasn't feeling mm. that great, so we wish Blair all the best in a speedy recovery and glad that he made the trip all the way down from Prince George. It's certainly uh, Albert's first opportunity here to get in and show how ready he is for this. Yeah, semifinalist last year, lost to Max Guan. Okay. Oh, he knows what it takes to go deep. Plays here religiously. So he definitely knows a lot of all the corners of these tables. Would Albert have been at the um, Ricky Walden event last year? Yes. I believe I Albert did battle him. Yep. I think I remember him from that. Is he the fellow that actually beat Ricky? No, that was Max Guan, who oh, okay. Albert lost to last year in the semifinals. Ross certainly got the uh, weight of the table on that last shot very well. Still a, a decent safety to be played from here, but something could end up over the uh, right pocket hole or left pocket hole. Yeah, it looks like our referee has just got to attend a matter on a different table as we were scheduled to have a additional gentleman being our roving referee, but unfortunately he hasn't shown up. Hopefully he's all right. Mm. So our co-tournament director, Lance Brahman, has stepped in. Lance has done a lot of refereeing in the pool world. He might be a bit confused because there's no numbers on the balls. And, and you don't have to hit a rail with a shot. <laughs> And you don't have to call flukes. Sounds like a pretty easy game, this game of snooker. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Looking on the screen, it looks like he might have had the black, but it must be just covered by that one red. We've been very fortunate on the TV table. Besides that first match, not many of them been, have been real grinding affairs. There's been a few lopsided matches, obviously, but it's good to see. There's 
certainly both of these uh, these guys are going for their shots playing with some confidence thinking they're going to make them so this might be another uh, relatively quick session depending on how it develops one red goes it might be nice just to bring the cue ball through that gap and be on the black ball looks like it would be fairly close Gap. Looks like with a shake of the head from Ross. They've both been a little unfortunate when they've tried for shots that they've seemed to have left each other a, a starter ball. No one's punished the other yet, but it could happen. Looking at the black there. Yeah. That looks like it was just a safety attempt. Could end up very nice. Just too hard. Yes, David, I'm just hearing uh, in our little breaks from time to time between matches, I'm hearing a few little gripes in the room. People going, only one person makes it into the knockout in a group of four. It's always been two. All right, fair enough. But I do return and tell them we have 52 players in this tournament. There's only one winner. You know, nobody said winning tournaments was easy. That's right. Never mind that to get it done in a three-day, the round robin to get it done in three days, or two and a half days effectively, is a challenge. True. And, you know, the generosity that we have from both Jonathan and Eric to open up their rooms but we have to do our due diligence to get the tournament day started early so they finish a little early so they can allow their paying customers to come in tonight so everybody's happy. Mm -hmm. And that is a big thing for the uh, room owners when, when they have one of these tournaments is that you don't want it going till 11 o'clock at night or 12 o'clock at night. You do want to be able to get your your regulars on a table by seven or eight o'clock at night.
It's not that the time generally is donated to the room or but to the tournament, but it's not getting what the room might norm might normally generate. And on the flip side, some of these room owners need to see if there's a tournament that's coming to their room that's up and coming, that's just going to put a spike in their revenue because a lot of players are going to be coming in wanting to practice a lot, get comfortable with mm -hmm. the tables. Plus it generates new faces in the room as well. So when people have come back a week or two later, they, they feel more comfortable in the room. through with the various ways that you could advertise about these tournaments these days, whether through m email listings, posters at billiard rooms, Facebook postings. There's a few players in here that have signed up, but I've never seen their face before in my life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's kind of funny that Jeremy Hopwood, a player from Australia, looks quite similar to an Irish player named Dermot Devine. And I had never met either of them before and got them mixed up. I'm like, sorry, I didn't know which one was the uh, convict and which one was the parole officer. <laughs> Is that to infer that one of them was a convict? <laughs> Albert snuck out to a small lead here as an opportunity to put a few more onto that. The long pink into the green corner. Easy with that abuse on that table, Albert. I don't think the table liked being slammed, and that's right where our tripod is, so we don't want to give the viewers that there's an earthquake coming. <laughs> Nicely done. Looks like you might have to hit this at pace to get it out for the next red. But decides just to make it. Or, ooh. Sometimes when you decide just to roll a ball in like that, you end up uh, slowing down the movement of the cue and kind of poking at it or decelerating. And I suspect that might have been what, what Ross did there. So you don't get the full stroke on the ball. who was a semi-finalist last year at the Seattle Snooker Open. That's fitting to be a, a great tournament coming up in a few months. That's going to run from June 22nd to June 24th down at the Ox Billiards Club. A lot of fun that was last year. It was almost fitting. It could have only been an all-Canadian final. It could have been an American-Canadian final, but alas, the two Americans dispatched of Ross and Brady Gold and the two Canadians right. to make it an all-American final. Uh, 
Yeah, it's a little unfortunate that our good friend Brady Golan, well, I'm pretty sure not for him, but he had to move out to Alberta. So he usually uh, comes out for these events when he was living uh, in the Penticton way. But now it's uh, quite a distance for him to travel. But hopefully we can see him again. I think some of these players, you know, the more higher players, you know, they're looking for obviously the big purse, but they've got to understand that we're still regrowing in Canada and growing in America. Mm -hmm. And not a lot of people know about the game of snooker, so you can't really just knock on a door and be like, hey, can you give me some money for the snooker tournament? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this isn't something that these players are doing to... Um to fill their wallets. Um, I'm not sure what the final prize money here is, but you know, it's uh, by the time you pay for travel and hotel and food and entry into it and all of those things, uh, the winnings, if you win, probably cover your expenses. But they, a lot of it's done for the true love of the game, so. And at the end of the day, it's nice to hoist the trophy and say, I want it, so. True. Take some of that away. You'll get your name on a small little plaque that will be attached to the trophy that will be on display come Championship Sunday when the final is going. Charlie Brown, who won it back in 2018, has his name there, as well as Brady Golan, Max Guan, and Albert Kenny last year. Because unfortunately, I don't have a lot of records of who has won previous BC Opens, and yours truly created the BC Open trophy. Mm -hmm. So I'm just putting on the dates that I can remember, and I've been involved running the tournaments. So. Mr. Brown was the first, and I'm pretty sure there's going to be many, many more to follow. That was one of the questions I was going to ask you, is that trophy uh, one that you made? Sir. So come out of the David Burney workshop. That is correct, sir. Thanks. I have a, a David Burney piece of art on my wall, which is a snooker clock that I carted back from Vancouver and I had to buy a new piece of luggage to get it to fit so I could bring it back on the plane. But I've got a Ricky Walden signature on it and sitting on my wall now. Well, glad to hear it made it safe and, well, you know, a little bit of money for the luggage because I don't think I charge you for that piece of art. <laughs> no, you didn't actually. <laughs> <laughs> it was something that had been promised from a number of years ago, and we had never managed to uh, figure out how to get it to Ontario. Yeah, I think there was that nasty little weird thing called the pandemic, because definitely mm. there was, a, with this game, there was a lot of good energy going, you know, with Snooker Canada, other organizations in Canada, you know, various coaching outfits uh, down in the U.S., uh, Bays had just recently opened on February 29th of 2020. And then come mid-March, the whole world shut down and Snooker North America just took a back seat as the rest of the world about all these things. But now things are coming back and as you and I have alluded to, David, there is a surge. We're seeing a lot more events, mm -hmm. a lot more events being filled and that's on the amateur scene as well as the professional scene. Yeah, we talked a bit earlier about it used to be, you know, five, six, seven, eight tournaments a year, maybe. And now we're uh, picking and choosing tournaments that are happening all the time. Trying to schedule yourself enough time to play and enough of them to qualify and all those things. So it's, uh, it's changing. We do need corporate, if anybody's listening in and then feels that a corporate sponsorship might be in their future. That would be a, a huge plus for this game. True, because our streams 
reach all corners of the globe. I know they're happy to tune in from England as I spread the good gospel of what we're doing in Canada. And it's just, you know, baby steps. As we all know, it wasn't Apollo 1 that got to the moon, it was Apollo 11. There's a nice shot. With no reward. If he's feeling brave, it might be brown in the corner. If not, it's something behind the pink ball. Well, when you speak of a uh, little corporate sponsors sponsorship there, David, our good friend Larry Anderson, always a supporter of Q Sports in BC. He does a lot of work with pool and as well with us in snooker has just let me know that he is a snooker certified referee. Oh, well, I'm going to be calling, emailing you soon, Larry. We'll get you, well, not on the bays, but watching the bays, shall we say. The, uh, just a quick aside on that one. Um, Ross played the roll up in behind the pink. And it doesn't look like he made it. So he's actually played a snooker on himself. And in that case, Albert definitely has the case of a free ball. Or he can put Ross back in as he's doing so right here. There seems to be some discussion. I'm wondering if Albert felt, or sorry, Ross felt that he made it to the pink or not. The referee has ruled that it didn't, so play on. Yeah, we tell the, the tell the players, obviously, the referee's ruling is final. If there is any debate about it, feel free to put it in running, and we can address it after the tournament. As we're not all perfect here, you know, their mistakes can happen. There's a lot of things going. is where the referee's job, as we talked about again, is very important to be able to make sure that those balls get put back exactly where they were so that the player can make adjustments, accurate adjustments, having missed the red the first time. Much better. This will be a good test of uh, Ross's temperament as that last series cost him a number of points. But That might be the year layoff for Ross. If he'd been playing a little bit more, getting his practice in here, pretty sure he would have been behind the black there. But it's still a good safety. I mean, Albert has to make a great shot here to, to either make a red. The safety is not automatic here either. Okay. It's one way to respond. Had Doug Wilson tuning in that there's been a, a lot of big money in the game in Canada. And it's been quite possible, you know, we know the game is largely Britain based. So they really have the support there. 
Um, I know, David, you did do some training over for coaching, and you probably can attest to that. Uh, I think they even have it in the school cur curriculum in Britain. Yes. So. Yeah. There's a, there's a WPBSA uh, system now where they take portable tables into school gyms and have the kids come through for a day or two and play snooker and the interesting thing there is that the way it's presented is not that it's about snooker it's about following rules and team play and math skills and uh, simple math uh, plus and minus working out angles like it's it's done as a life skills presentation and it's wonderful the way that they get young kids up there and playing and Steve Davis is one of the proponents of it and he goes on these things with the with the coaching staff from the from the organization and it's uh, they really do a good job of it it would be nice to get the same kind of events going here in Canada to introduce it to young people before they get too tired tied into their phones and technology but of course we have all sorts of rules about having to pass police check and good rules by the way having to pass police checks and get through um, all sorts of qualifying and and um, checks and stuff like that that have to happen before you can do anything with the school board so like I said, baby steps, but uh, that mm -hmm. seems music to my ears. Getting out of the classroom to go into the gym to play some snooker? Sign me up. Where was that when I was a kid? Yeah. And when you have the opportunity of working at the Q Zone, which is the um, public area outside of the main World Snooker Tour events, um, they bring a, a number of these tables along so kids can start playing on them. And uh, it's always fun. I've had the opportunity of doing that a couple of times now. And it's always fun getting the kids involved and parents involved, all of that. In the old days, it used to be that people didn't want their kids going to pool halls because they were full of smoke and um, and drinking and all of that stuff. Now the drinking social part of it is still there, but they're not smoke-filled taverns anymore because of the non-smoking rules. So it makes it a little more accessible for younger younger people. Yeah, it's definitely becoming a couple of very nice safeties being played here by these guys. Mm-hmm. That's a that's a really nice one as well. It's becoming a more family friendly environment. As even we can see in this tournament right here, we have Hannah who's refereeing this match and her daughter Margot was playing in the tournament. Again here just talking a bit about the, the role of the referee. It's up to the player here to make sure that the referee has had the chance. Oh my goodness, has had the chance <laughs> to see where that ball was in case he missed it, which he obviously didn't do. That's <laughs> a uh, a fluke of epic proportions. Yep, our uh, good co-turn tournament director Lance Bromlin just probably shot about ten feet out of his chair after seeing that <laughs> shot. <laughs> But the players generally give the referee a moment to line up where that ball is and to look at the other balls that may come into play so that they can replace them if, if the uh, player that is snookered misses the ball that's on. But in that case, that wasn't necessary. So 
So a slim four point advantage for Albert Lamb in this first frame of best of three. Albert desperately wanting to win this one so he can match Dave Daly at two wins to nothing in their group. But I think Ross wants to play spoiler. And we are down to the colors. As most of these games come down to. You had the right idea there, trying to get the cue ball back behind pink and green, leave the yellow up top. But it is a bit thick. It's the one thing that a North American audience would have to get used to in snooker is that this kind of safety play is as integral to the part or to, the, to the game as being uh, as, as the games that where someone runs 50, 60 or 100 points. This is, is much more of the strategy and the planning and the, the chess moves as opposed to a straight out run of the balls. Yeah, I think sometimes here and there in the amateur game, players don't punish too much for mistakes. So sometimes it could be a tough part for the North American audience and South America, I think, as you say, David, that What's with this safety belt? Why isn't anyone making a pot or anything like that? But I think as we continue to grow, we're going to see these safety battles being even more important because these players are going to get stronger and they are going to be able to punish their opponent. Yes. Yeah, when, when you make a mistake at this level, you kind of think that you're going to get another opportunity. Whereas as you move deeper in the tournament and the average level of play of player goes up, then you will get punished more and you will perhaps not be quite as willing to take that, take on that silly shot. Well, especially when you play David Putty, he doesn't uh, allow you any relief. <laughs> take no prisoners. That's Putty's motto. <laughs> I wish my game were at that level. I do, I, my, my competitive game may be behind me, but I do love being involved in the sport. Both as, uh, well, doing the commentary and, and refing and being involved, as David said, kind of doing some coaching from time to time. That was an interesting shot. I think that was intentional. He came off the top rail trying to kick the green down the table, but ended up opposite, but that shot would have been very difficult to make and would not have offered him any position on the ground. Yeah, still no clear favorite in this first frame, and I think that's living up to the billing. Both good players, you know it's going to be a battle probably down to the last few balls. Dennis chiming in, giving his support for Albert. That's another beautiful match that we're going to have tomorrow. Dennis Lysenko and Gordon Wu both tied at two wins to nothing. So it's going to be mouth watering Saturday morning tomorrow here at the 2024 BC Open Snooker Championship.
Both of them have come close to making this ball. They haven't been leaving great opportunities once they miss. I think this table is playing slower than they than they think. He played the right shot there, trying to get the cue ball behind the pink on the rail there. But they're both coming up just short. The shot before that, when Ross tried to get him behind the brown or put the brown ball in between the green and the cue ball, that one was short as well. The shot that uh, Albert just played was short by about a foot trying to get it behind the pink. Yeah, definitely a lot more action in the room here. It does tend to get a little bit busier a little later on a Friday night, but lots of active tournament tables in play. We've got some audience members coming in to take the action. And all the pool tables are full and all of that in the room? Uh, there's a few open. Yeah. Quiet in my basement. <laughs> I think that might just be an testament to uh, the community here at Top 147. Obviously, a lot of people that are regulars are aware of what's going on this weekend, so maybe they might just... Uh, as much mm. as they love their Q sports, they might want to just take a break, whether it's yeah. Chinese eight ball pool. Uh, it's going to be a tough uh, bracket to get on a snooker table in here this weekend because we're using all seven tables. So they have seven full-size snooker tables now? That is correct. Nice. Oh, and this could get, oh no, yeah, it got worse. Yep. Free so ball the potential. Would be, it's a seven point foul. It's a free ball. And Ross also has the option of making Albert shoot again from there. So I suspect this will be a bit of a Massé attempt. Just to get it around the pink. Oh. Yeah. I don't know if he got lucky there. It does look really thin on our TV screens, but just looking live, it's not as thin as you may think. Is a, a good chance at making this ball and bringing the cue ball back down table just a bit. May have overhit that one. So now Ross has the four point lead. Needs brown and blue for a, a double black if that's where he stopped. Needs the pink to guarantee the win of the frame. It's not going to be happy with that one. No. So at this point, they both need the pink ball to win. Black doesn't necessarily need to come into play. Mm-hmm. 
that might be all Ross should need. They're all sitting there. He's been careful of his waistcoat on that pink. Yep, Ross, break out the 22. There are a bunch of ducks on the pond right here. <laughs> pretty good steal because Albert was looking pretty strong at the early onset of this frame. So we'll see if Albert can shake this off and put together a, a strong second frame to force us into decider. But hopefully the he moment... Doesn't, he, he doesn't need to do anything to get to the black. Just make the pink game frame. And this is just a random choice to shoot the black on a try bank corner. There you go, Ross. <laughs> 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 now he's just showing off with what Caleb Tapp That's used right. to say about Ross. But Ross Bradson takes that one 70 to 44, and we'll step aside and come back for frame two action of our final match of day one. And as referee Lysenko just sets up uh, the triangle of reds, do we have any stats on that first frame that you'd like to share, Mr. Putty? No, my snooker pro thing didn't work still. I may have to call support on that one to get it working. You know my technical prowess with uh, technology, Dave. It doesn't exist. So just off a little bit. Ross has pointed out. All you new uh, players and fans of the game, remember when you are racking that triangle, it's the peak of the triangle of the red has to go as close to the pink without touching. However, if your pink ball has a little bit of space, it's not the end of the world as long as it cannot be potted into either top corner pocket. I know David and I have been talking about you know, getting the youth. We need the young players to get in the game to continue to grow. And that goes as well for behind the scenes. We need young referees, young tournament directors, commentators. Yeah, I know David and I are not going to live forever. Well, maybe David is. I, I think he's got a strong diet of vampire's <laughs> blood. Yeah, I have a relatively big birthday coming up. And I'm feeling about 40 years younger than my age. So it's fun doing all of this stuff, uh, keeping up with uh, snooker and other things in my life so well it's not work if you love what you're doing yeah it's a nice shot it's a very good out when i think of it i've been around this game now for almost 56 years in one of my lifetime uh, games that I've played. I 
I don't think I've been around for that long on this earth. In experience, you have. <laughs> Not sure if our, our good friend John Talish is tuning in. He's a gentleman I met down in Brazil. A great referee, great uh, lover of the game, and very absorbing. I gave him a few pointers, and he was just soaking it in like a sponge. But we got chatting, and he was amazed that I was 10 years older than him. He thought I was 10 years younger than him. So uh, the check's in the mail, John. But definitely a really good scene down there in Rio. We had, I believe, I think there was six Jokari tables. Those are the national brand down there. And they had referees and scorekeepers on every table. So it's a real good family environment down there. Uh, everyone's happy just to do their part. And when you get to these national championships and have the championships and all of that, um, it should, you know, it, eventually it will, but it should have that kind of serious respectability built in the game of having a referee and a scorekeeper on each table. But you need a bigger volunteer base than what we have at the moment. I think we can get there. I think so too. I think, you know, if, if you love this game and you want to watch a lot of snooker, well, scorekeeping is the best seat in the house. You Actually, don't even the referee is the best seat in the house. <laughs> you get right up close to the players and see everything they do. Can I ask you that when there's a foul and a miss and the cue ball goes and disturbs all the reds and you have to respot about 14 out of 15 reds? <laughs> Welcome to my nightmare. Um, <laughs> you do the best you can. Mm -hmm. In in the higher level tournaments, they have uh, the video going. So, you know, even in this case, there's a video going. And assuming it's being recorded, if the, if everything got scattered and color balls were everywhere where they, you know, weren't before the shot, you could actually rebuild the table to the best of your ability. And the players would understand that it's not going to be perfect. But then everybody is just doing the best they can. And I'm not sure if you've heard of this technology, David. I haven't seen it in practice, but these lasers that they're talking about that mm -hmm. would shine down on the table and put exactly where the spots are. It, it sounds like it's a great idea. I just have not seen it in use. I, my, my, I've heard of it. I haven't seen it in use. My thinking it would be a great thing to have but if we can't afford to pay referees yet or scorekeepers, I don't know that we can afford a fifty or sixty thousand dollar <laughs> tracking system for balls. I'm almost even talking about in like the pro circuit. You know, oh, in the pro uh, circuit. Yeah, I think everybody likes the humanity of the referees. Um, Fair enough. Good point. Yeah, I can see where you're coming from with that. Um, because, yeah, definitely you make a good point that that laser technology probably is not cheap. Uh, but we see sometimes that can be a real drag in a match when things happen like that. And then they go into the stream and then rewind it to just before the shot. And then the you know referee and video producer or chatting back and forth and putting it back, it can really kind of take the momentum and the mm -hmm. air out of a match. And the, and the players lose momentum and focus. Never mind the audience and everybody else. Well, this might be a mistake well. for Albert.
Ross just waiting for our, our good friend, bad boy Bill Cormilo, coming all the way from Calgary. Bill just loves us snooker in every event. We missed him last year. A little hiccup on the scheduling, but good to see him back in the room. Once was scouted by the Milwaukee Braves. So Bill's Is quite a call. Is that a pitcher or a fielder? Or? Uh, I haven't asked him, and I dare say a bat boy, but I'm pretty sure uh, <laughs> Bill's quite athletic. Still a very limber older gentleman. He is scheduled to actually play Francis Chow on the TV table tomorrow at noon, or at 2 p.m., my apologies, rounding up our round-robin matches. So it's kind of like the old guard battling the uh, new and upcoming uh, young female talent from America. But I've heard Bill is an avid skier out in uh, Alberta, so... I remember being at Bill's house on uh, one of my cross-country trips at one point. Had a beautiful table down in his basement. Ah, uh, yes. Was that the uh, when we were at the Western Canadian Championships at the Leather Pockets? That likely was that. Yes. True. I do remember that birthday airport ride. <laughs> <laughs> the one that my wife never lets me forget. <laughs> <laughs> uh, an April 29th uh, date of some kind out there. <laughs> Actually, the funny thing with that is that she took herself down to uh, Ellicottville, down in uh, the United States, in New York, for the same weekend, and she felt... And she was right. She felt absolutely justified in doing that because I was away on her birthday. So actually, that would have been five, six years ago. Okay? Wow. Because not only was it a birthday, but it was her 50th birthday. So there was my dedication to the sport at the time. So just remember, if you're a snooker fan, don't get involved with a Taurus because their birthday is probably going to come right around the time of the World Championships. And how can you excuse yourself to go off to Sheffield when your loved That's one right. is turning 50? Yeah, I tried to pre. Perfect, that was the perfect time to play that bank. Because he wasn't leaving a shot that Ross would have liked to have taken if, if the bank had been missed. And he was going to end up in pretty much perfect position for Black. I like that he played that with the confidence to, he unfortunately got a little flick off the black there to make it tougher, but he played that shot full of confidence of making the black and getting position. If he's going to go for that red, he's just got to be mindful of that other red that he's going to be queuing over. He'll probably need an extension on his queue for this.
think Albert will take this one on on the side. Could have been a lot worse for Albert. Mm -hmm. Let's see if Ross can punish Albert for that mistake. Could be a costly mistake. Yeah, it's got a nice sound of on this black to get on that red below of the four reds. I think the one furthest away from the pink would be the one that would go. Seven. This cue ball just has to float to that position. It's a very pocket weight shot. Yeah. He chose to take the cue ball into that group of four. Trust the luck that he would get position on the red, which he has. Nope. Well, he's fortunate he's got a good cue ball tight against that top cushion. And with reds in the bulk area, a simple Run and hide in bulk areas, not on the table for Ross. Middle red by the, the three reds up by the pink there might have gone in the side, but we may find out now. A little bit of care here to make sure the cue ball doesn't end up in the corner pocket, which it didn't. Got a brown ball on the side.
they've just been missing these side shots by just very, very small margins. And four or five of them this frame alone, where they've just hit the far horn, or as Albert just did, he just hit the near horn with that brown ball. So they haven't quite found the spots. Yeah, usually on a snooker table, those middle pockets are a little bit more forgiving than on a pool table. As they have more of a curved edge jaw, whereas the pool table kind of points out like a jagged edge. And it also comes down to what's called the, the fall line of the table as to how deep those pockets are cut into the bed of the table. So that if your cue ball gets so if your ball gets close to this to falling, depending where the drop is on those pockets will determine how easy or hard those pockets are to make balls in. This again is a very difficult table to put a run together on. Kind of a scrambled table. It's really just blue and black. That's a good positional shot. Blue and black are about the only two balls that are readily available. Albert's built himself a sort of a comfortable medium lead at this point. Here's a nice shot. Nice response uh, by Ross to your comment there, uh, David. <laughs> as much as Albert <laughs> has a lead, uh, Ross quickly wants to evaporate that or at least shrink it uh, by some margin. Looks like they're the Body pathway through. You went about a quarter of a few ball too far. Maybe not. He's trying it. Uh. I think snooker players are notorious for trying to convince themselves that they can get a shot that's unmakeable. So something like that looks like it was really tight on the green ball and he had to swerve it a little bit to be able to make it. And we try and convince ourselves that it can be done. Does the cutback double into your mind, uh, Mr. Putty, well, on the brown? <clears throat> That's the brown ball on the rail, don't forget. Mm -hmm. It's not a red. Is any on color? That's right. Okay, yes. So, yes. Be just because the table's so scrambled, 
But you might as well grab some points. But he certainly wasn't playing any positional shape there, right? It was just a, a straight pot. So a 26 point advantage for Albert Lamb in the second frame. 51 points on the table. Albert needs this frame to keep his chances alive of winning the match and getting a two wins to zero losses in the group to equalize Dave Daly to set up a great match that will be happening tomorrow at 10 a.m. A little bit of cat and mouse being played here. may find that that red right behind the pink becomes incredibly important at some point in the game. If either player plays a hook with the cue ball down in the bulk end, that's a very difficult red to hit and can easily turn into with three putbacks um, 16 or more points. See how that develops. Like to be a nice shop, Albert. Although, looks like Ross can just clip off that red closer to the middle pocket. Given where the other two balls are, he may even try this as a cross bank side. Loves your uncle. He's confident of making the yellow. He plays the yellow and then plays the lockdown safety on the red, but it looks like it's another. Oh, he under hit it. Uh, yeah. I think his plan might have been to put it down to the bottom rail and hook on both through, through the yellow ball on the one and the pink on the other. But under hit it. There it is. Very nice shot there by Albert. So our referee Hannah Lesovenko just making a quick little mark with uh, the Taylor's pencil, just in case this needs to be put back. Ooh. 
I think it moved. I think it moves. I'm in for a shave. It was a very thin hit. <laughs> Ross having a good smile off the table. <laughs> Commenting to our score people. You see that one? And this is going to be a little short of pace to get behind the green and brown, but everything else is right on that one. You can see about a sixteenth of this red that he's trying to hit. on Albert we're paying the referees to do a good job you can put it back if you want to <laughs> play here would be to put it back but he's got it again this might be a little easier though that just goes down to Albert being in here night and day practicing knowing the weight of these beautiful rass on tables It'll be a nice hit. Well, yeah. Ross isn't too shabby himself. I know why, being with a 32 point lead, I might seriously consider moving that red by the pink. Just going to go over to the side rail. And what that does is it stops Ross from playing that perfect hook and getting a whole lot of points off of it. I think that was probably the, the smart shot in that situation. Nicely done. The one thing here for Albert is that if he makes the red in any color, pretty much, then he's in a situation where the best Ross could do is tie or need stickers. So one red in any color and Albert has some security. Trying to snip it behind the black here. Yep. Might just have a thin snick on that red against the top cushion. And you can see him pointing to the table where he wants the cue ball to finish, just down by the yellow. He's 
left a long red open for Ross. Thirty-one. It's unfortunate for Ross there that he didn't end up in a more positive shape position. He'll play the roll-up. He's got the snooker. Say on this one. Left hand siding. Yes. And a fortunate double kiss. Sometimes the dreaded double kiss can leer its head in this game, but on that instant, Albert's okay. him for hitting that horn. Mm -hmm. Albert, of course, would be aware that all he needs is this red. So then you time your aggression with your knowing that you need to also make sure it ends up safe. And just knock it in. But he hit that ball so well that his part two of it, which was get the cue ball down to the bottom rail, was absolutely perfect. Nicely done. Oh, I think everybody there, even referee, thought that yellow was going in. So 32 with 27 on the table. Ross needs two successful snookers. One of them is sitting right there by the green ball. Green and brown should be an easy one. Sometimes when you need a couple snookers, you need to lay four or five. Mm -hmm. You needed to bring that cue ball more to the middle of the table, below the ball plane. But that's it's just come out. Yeah, he almost recovered nicely, but saluted Mr. Green, just peeked out his head in the billiard room. The other play here is, of course, is that Ross makes the green and brown, and then it's only one hook to tie on the blue. He's going for the corner hook. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite. 
Yeah, it's a game of talent, technique, and at sometimes creativity comes into play. The only person I've ever really seen that what he was, what he was trying to do there was lay the cue ball in tight against the rail, so that Albert couldn't see past the side rail to get to the ball. The only one I've ever seen do that really well was Ronnie O'Sullivan, and he played it perfectly. So thirty-five is the three uh, three hook rule in play there. Yep, if you need more than three snookers to win, it's a concession. And we're not quite there. Mm -hmm. As Ross can win if he gets three snookers. He, would, he could win by one. Mm-hmm. And we're counting those as four point snookers, not you know, obviously not the, yeah, the there could the be board. seven, but the uh those are very rare, shall we say. I'm surprised someone hasn't chimed in about that. Was well, it four point snookers or seven point snookers? Not, ooh, he didn't hit this too hard if he misses. No, he's got it. There's the concession right there. So we are going to a decider between Albert Lamb and Ross Bradson. So quickly step out for a quick drink or something like that as both our players go for a comfort break. And we'll be right back with this exciting deciding frame. See you in a minute. Well, Albert Lamb rebounded nicely to take that second frame to force us into decider after Ross Bradson stormed ahead in the first frame. But we'll see how Ross can react here. Handshakes happen. And here we go. He's left a long red for Ross. The unfortunate part is that black isn't going to go to the top left corner. So it looks like a, just a clip off the red by the
sponge and come back into the bulk area. There's always a temptation for the player to take that loose red to the right of the pack. But you have to make sure you can get around the back of it or back down table if you do. And he's playing, playing the safety here off the red to the right of the pack. Very I always nice think of this there. section of the game as being like moving the pawns in a chess game. There's nothing, nothing much happens but a few safeties at the beginning, but the game gets set up like a chess game strategy. Mm, tried the containing safety, but unfortunately went in off. They're each leaving a, an opportunity to get back down to the bulk each time, but one of the t one of these times that won't be the case. Yeah, they're really putting this black out of commission. There's a lot of those reds are getting close to the black. Probably a containing, yeah, oops. That's definitely how a decider should be. Edgy, nervy, tense. He's not. Again, we'll see what Moody's in here. Brown in the side or roll up behind the green. Brown in the side. interesting part of that shot is that if, if what you're doing is getting the points on the board that's that's okay if you're confident of making that brown it's better to play it with a little more pace and oh there you go um and bring your cue ball down for it down table further but he has made a very nice red there to follow up and has a great angle on the green to move the cue ball up into the, the reds
This is where some of the years and years of experience that Ross has might just come into his favor in this match against Albert. natural line back up he may take the brown depending on the angles that we can't see Just ran on just a bit too much in that last shot. It was a bit high on the, or low, shall I say, on that red. That made it just a bit more difficult for Ross. As long as that black ball sits in the middle of all those reds, it will be a hard table to put a run together on. He does have one to the left top pocket here. Uh, had a lot of pace on that shot. Rose into the bottom rail. Got a two ball plant into the right corner. Robert certainly playing safety position on this. Let's make sure he doesn't crash into the brown or the green with this shot. Kind of going for the jugular there. I think that's going to be pretty tough if the pink goes back on its spot with those two reds 
close together near that pink spot. We'll find out soon. He's got a good angle. Just asking for the cue ball to be clean. I wonder if that pink spots. Or if it will go down on the green spot. Again, looking at the camera angle, it's hard to see. He may also have a shot here on the angle he's on to move those reds. I think this red just to the right of the pink spot might go past the pink when it gets respotted. Absolutely. It's a great spot there by referee Lesovenko. All you up and coming referees, you don't drop it on the spot. You put it a few inches before the spot and then roll that cue ball onto its home. There a Looks gap like there. The black goes now. It does kind of look like there's a pathway. Yeah. Fairly important 14 points for Albert there. And I'm slightly in the lead from being behind. Well, I certainly hope that cue ball would be closer to the top rail. Taking a close look at that red, it must not go. Danger on this long red for Ross, to the top right yep. corner pocket. <clears throat> sometimes you leave that. Sometimes you leave that shot out there just to tempt your opponent into it. Very fortunately, Cannon into the blue there. At that pace, it was going to go in and out of bulk and come back to the top end of the table. Be a nice safety. Yep. It's a little thick.
attempt here. The problem with that shot is that he, the typical way of playing that is with a bit of right hand siding, which then brings the cue ball back in on the line that you're aiming. So you tend to undercut those balls. And you do it so that you miss that red on the top rail and have the cue ball go back down, but he brought it in too much that time. Might be a bit too low on the screen to yeah. run through to get onto the red below the pink. So this is just, just taking the, the points and seeing if he can get to a position where he has a long shot on the red. But you got to make the colored ball to be on a red afterwards. The aggressive ball to play on that one for shape would have been the blue into the right corner. But they're both playing pretty cautiously now. They know what's on the line. Definitely for Albert and all his followers. This would put him in a tie for first place with a very big match tomorrow morning against Dave Daly. Winner of that match will win the group and move on to the knockout phase. Ross Bratson unfortunately fell to defeat to Dave Daly earlier. So he's just kind of playing spoiler. It's funny how the players look to the heavens when those <laughs> balls don't go into the pocket, but then they're all right when the red or the white doesn't drop in the pocket. This is our final match of day one here at the 2024 BC Open Snooker Championship. We're live at Top 147, Snooker and Billiards Lounge in Richmond, British Columbia. David Burney's in the booth alongside David Putty. And as well, our friends over at the Star Snooker Club are helping us out, make sure the tournament is a success. They might be streaming a match over there if it's still televised on their mm -hmm. Facebook page. But unfortunately, they won't have commentary over there. They'll just have the live feed of the match. I see Charlie Brown played a couple of his matches and it looks like he won both of his trains. Yeah. yeah, he's scheduled to be on the TV table tomorrow morning at 10 a.m.
So, David, as a referee, if you're refereeing a match, when is the moment where you kind of start looking at a player that is taking a long time over a shot? Just hearing some rumblings here and there that some players seem like they're taking a little bit extra time. If it's... <clears throat> If it happens once or twice or a couple of times during a match, it's not of particular note. If it's happening every shot, you know, where the shot really is, is obvious, but the player is not taking it. It's a hard one because there is no hard and fast rule mm -hmm. that says you have 10 seconds between shots. True. Or, you know, 20 or 30 or 40 or a minute. Because this game, sometimes you can have a very complicated shot that takes time to understand what you want to do with it. But, it, so, so if it, I know I'm taking a while to answer this. If it looks like it is going to happen all the time and every time, then you would have words and give warning to the player that you need to speed it up. But it has to be done gently, I guess. Because then if it continues, you, you can at some point, at referee's discretion, make a decision for penalty points or a frame. That was a heck of a shot. He had a ton of right hand siding mm -hmm. on that ball. Now there's an opportunity to break those four reds out. Or break some of them out on the angle that he has on the block. Yes, David and I have seen some professional games. It is quite phenomenal when you sometimes look at matches on the pro circuit when you're live and in the arena. And they put together a 60 break and you look up at the clock and only eight minutes has passed. Yeah. <laughs> so again, happy to take the, uh, the eight points on that one and and run. Yeah, he's given Albert an opportunity for this red into the top right corner. Which I think that red by the black spot is going to block the he's, path. He's, he's passing on that one. He's gone into defense safety mode. How does Ross like this mid to long range red into that same corner pocket? Basically the same shot. You stun it over, you get shape on pink in the side or blue or green, whatever that is. Blue. Green. It's green. at times most of the time it is the brown and the reds that people can get mixed up with the colors and uh, some people that have the colorblind affliction can actually ask the referee if that is a red or a brown but before the match they must declare that they're actually legally colorblind for it to be okay if they do not do that and they ask the referee if that's a red or a brown a foul would incur Do you know the two most prominent players that are colorblind? 
I do not, but it kind of sounded if we went back in time a little bit what commentator is. <laughs> <laughs> Who are the that. players? Uh, Peter Ebden and uh, Mark Williams. Are the two that I've heard are colorblind. From time to time, you'll see Mark make the request. And as well, I think documentation needs to be presented as well. You can't just go, hey, I'm colorblind <laughs> and come into a match. I don't think at that, like at the pro level, I mean, everybody knows like all the refs would know who who is and who isn't. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't be able to make it up. But well, this is an interesting attempt. Can you inside? Yep. But I think, for instance, if David, if you you know went onto the pro tour and you were legally declared colorblind. In the onset, obviously, you'd have to provide documentation to of the course. officials. Because yeah. these players are trying for every little slight advantage to get ahead. You know, sometimes you see players just asking a few more often than not to get the uh, cue ball clean, just hoping that maybe one of these more amateur refs will just mark the ball off by a millimeter here or there just to give them the advantage. Mm -hmm. That's a nice shot and in good position. Plays this, has the cue ball go towards the side rail. He'll end up with shape on one of those two reds on the right rail. I see that. Almost all tied up again. Very nicely struck. Looked like it was a straight on blue, so I had to put some uh, bottom on it to just stun it so it didn't follow into that pocket. He struck a few nice balls here. I'm, I'm thinking he might be tempted to go and try and make this one. See how his confidence is. Oh. And now we're in a tough little pickle here. There's all the colored balls are on the bulk end and the red balls are at the top end. So a lot of miles to put on that cue ball to put it run together here. Oh, 
couple of fortunate kisses there. Do not have that cue ball stay up top. Yeah, you just wonder at the long day, maybe a little fatigue is setting in. That's a really nice shot. And what it, no matter what Ross does when he hits these reds, it, that whole pack of five reds will open up. As they say, the basket of cherries is going to fall onto the ground. Mm -hmm. And his his hope is that it doesn't end up kicking one out in front of one of the corner pockets. One saving grace for Ross, there isn't really a, a color close by. I'm just going to have to put some mileage, as David alluded to, with his cue ball. What I see with both of these players is that when they go to hit the ball medium to plus speed. They both have a fair amount of body movement, so shots that you would anticipate them making are getting much more difficult as they move a bit. Looks like this pink goes by. This is going to be helpful for both players. Get it back on its spot. I'm shocked on our TV angle that didn't look like that was even possible. left Albert an easy starter. Yeah. Albert being a left-hander just has to be mindful of those reds queuing over them. Why is he taking up the rest? One more good positional play here. Ross's 12-point lead could disappear pretty quickly. Bing, cross bank black or playing safe? One or the other.
worked out pretty well. You almost put the black in, but it's good, uh, good cue ball thinking. Turned out fairly well for Elfie. Definitely considering the pace that was on that shot, steaming in and out of bulk. We hit it, of course, he hit it much thinner than he was aiming, so the speed stayed in the cue ball as opposed to slowing down. True on first glance. I was a little bit worried for Ross that he might cannon into that open red on the right side, but yeah, he hit thin it too snick. thick. He was going to. He hit it nice and thin. But sometimes it's hard to do with when you're looking way down the length of a rest. As he lured Ross in, it's a long red. It looks rather, it could be rather straight. Just trying to look out the window of our commentating booth. And at least the pink is sitting there. He didn't have to do anything to get medium shape. So. I don't think there'll be any heroics. And he's looking down the table. Ross and Dave Daly wishing, willing that to go in, hoping, as I'm pretty sure, the Irish-born, now Seattle-based player. He's cheering for every hope that Ross can take this match. That would put Dave Daly into the knockout round. Yeah, that's a little too hard. Get this into a nice position. There's brown, pink, blue, green to hide behind. Kind of don't mind him taking on this shot just at the angle. No. Uh, if he misses this red, the cue ball is going to come back up table. So rather shot to nothing here for Ross. Well, 
It's actually a really nice weight that he played it at. He left himself right by the pink, blue, and black. Yeah, a couple more rotations, and he would have just been laughing all the way to the bank out of the right yeah. ankle on the black. Unfortunately, just a little straight on this black. But eight points is eight points, and still at the table. Great. I'd like to see this one go in, too. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> Ross didn't want it co to go in. <laughs> so referee Lisovenko taking a good look. Just getting her trusty Taylor's pencil out there just to make a small little mark. It's been a long day for Hannah. She was over at Star Snooker Club earlier being the Roverina referee. We really appreciate all her help. That could absolutely be the shot that wins this match. The chances of a free ball, if he does miss it, are very high. And with the free ball, you can always get a better snooker, maybe, or something like that, by declaring any ball on the table as the ball on. Robert so definitely appreciates the trouble he's in here. However, for all our new viewers and youngsters out there, when that free ball is there, you can't roll up to the free ball. You cannot lay a snooker behind that nominated free ball. Let's see what Albert can do here. And granted, going back to the, the shot duration, obviously, Dave, you make an accurate point. You know, you're not going to be uh, grilling Albert here. This is a very tricky shot. Needs a lot of care. So you respect that uh, there's a lot of time going into yeah. it. This, this is not a 15-second shot. I think his, his best way is three rails coming at it from the backside. But let's see what he does. True. Now, by snooker yeah. rules, that is a free ball. The ball on is the red, and the, and the next player cannot see both sides of that red. Yeah, I think Ross might just let some points accumulate well, he can take as the red four. was on. Mm -hmm. he, can take six, he can take all four fouls here and be in a position where Albert would be finishing needing a snooker. You see, Albert learned what he needed to learn on that one. That's a great shot. That's absolutely Fantastic. Great shot. <laughs> and the crowd and high fives from <laughs> Ross. Good to see. That was that was the three reds uh, three rails I looked at when that might have been the way to do it. So well done. I think the red is or the cue ball has just come to be touching black, so that's taken away the pawning angle on this red. Yeah, that was a great hit. Ross with a 25 point advantage, 35 points on the table. So certainly he's kind of in the driver's seats in this deciding frame. But we've always known this game to have many twists and turns. So just asking for the Redwoods. 
The shot here, of course, is to come off the top rail, hit the red, and have the cue ball drift in behind the black ball again. But that has to be played with um, very fine control. Oh, the hunt is on for a long queue. Ross doesn't have a lot of the attachments, but he does have, they do have one of those, as you can see in the bottom of the screen. Telescopic extenders. Mm-hmm, with the suction cup as Ross's queue. He's had it for many, many years. Probably didn't uh, come with that female screw on the bottom. Mm. There was one play today where the uh, player had to have his his extension on, plus the uh, telescopic one. It was that far down the table. And I think they found something over on table six. Ross just doing a little bit of measurement just to take a look. Someone else is offering something. Benit's offering an extension on an extension. Yeah. Let's see if he... He can't reach it still. Which is rather bizarre as... Ross is definitely one of the taller players on the circuit out here. Ball behind the ground would be the attempt here. A little strong but fortunate he's up against the vault cushion. So a very well played safety. I mean the the odds of making this ball are very slim. Ross can see it, so he can play a safety off of it. And the attempt here would probably be to put the cue ball behind the black ball. baiting Albert into taking this long pot. Definitely dangerous. Dangerous both ways. If he makes it, it's almost guaranteed bot position. Or you do that. Ooh, nice kiss off the pink.
Sometimes it's tough to have the 25 point lead at this point. Because what you don't really want to do is get into negative thinking and be afraid of losing the lead. You want to keep control. But it's very easy to go down that rabbit hole. Yeah, definitely if Ross can put a color vault safe against the cushion, that will really help his chances of... Oh, that's a nice cannon to the green Another for nice Albert. Shot. Doesn't want to miss this. The black might come into play. He's got hit center. Nice. Oh. And Ross has had quite a result there. <laughs> Been an interesting red ball. Sure, what the discussion is here. I'm not sure. True, there's 25 points in it. So if it, Albert 30, is to miss. 25 on the table, so. I guess maybe he's just uh, making sure the referee knows that if he misses, he can be put back. This one is, is a relatively easy hit. I'd be very surprised if he misses it. Oh, I think there's a pathway for this red. Tough to see on the TV angle. I know you're way out there in Ontario, David, but looking through the commentating window here at top 147. It's on. I think it's on. I think it's on. Yeah, Ross has taken that on. Cold-blooded. So now one successful snooker is needed, and then... Oh no, 26. Sorry. Let's make it yep. ball. Needs this blue to put us in snooker's required stage. Even our stream's getting a little excited there. It froze with anticipation. So here's that same situation that was in the previous match. 31 points with 27 on the table. Doesn't have the angle to get behind the brown. He could pull the brown, so the cue ball tight to the side of the brown ball and have the yellow ball go two rails down to the side rail on the far side by the green pocket.
This is where Ross wants to start rolling that yellow ball right over the hole. So this one just to play the yellow pocket weight right into the corner. Good cue ball, tight to that ball cushion. One of the points of rolling it over the pocket and making it so that Albert can't miss it is that it's worth, on the table as a foul ball, it's worth four. If he forces Albert to make it, it's only worth two and it would put Albert into a situation where he would need two hooks, point-wise. Or just or slam just it into it. the bottom of the pocket. Or just make the heck out of the ball. Two hooks to tie. Yeah, I think if the screen finds the bottom of the pocket, it's going to be handshanks. And there's going to be a happy Irishman here in Richmond <laughs> as Dave Daly is going to be moving on to the knockout round. <laughs> Don't it's pop the shh. Don't pop the champagne just let yet, Dave. Not yet. Put the yellow in from long distance. You just don't want the cue ball flying around out of control here, that's all. Oh, oh what that's a shot. Like yeah, it's with that. The same as the yellow. You know, flying around, there's always a chance that that uh, cue ball could find the bottom of a pocket, and then that's an easy four points. Albert really wouldn't have to work for it. But it should be handshakes here. It's going to make an exciting uh, Saturday for us at the BC Open. Nicely done. Just for fun, slam the pink in. <laughs> Got to get the blue first, David. <laughs> so handshakes right oh, there. That. Albert was already throwing the chalk on the table, so. <laughs> so Ross Brasson takes that one by two frames to one. That's going to conclude our broadcast for today here from Top 147 Snookered and Billiards Lounge. It's the 2024 BC Open Snooker Championships. Any final words, David Buddy? Well, this has been a fun day of getting uh, back and uh, talking snooker for the day. Um, watch some good snooker. Uh, very impressed with the uh, with the young lady, young 18-year-old uh, girl coming out and playing. I think that's a great sign for our sport. And uh, we'll get to see more tomorrow. So thank you and uh, have a great night, everybody. And thank you, David Burney, for the invite. And we'll, uh, we'll chat more tomorrow. That is the case. We go live to air tomorrow, 10 a.m., Pacific Standard Time, looking to have uh, Charlie Brown, a fan favorite, on the TV table. 
So that will be fun and exciting. And obviously at 12 p.m. there's going to be an exciting match between CCU and John Shoring as they're going to be battling to see who wins that group and more moves on to the knockout stage. So thanks for joining us all day long, everybody. You've been a great viewership. And don't stall out now, uh, stream. We're about to sign off. So for David Putty, right. it's David Bernie saying good night, everybody. Get home safe, and we'll see you tomorrow at 10. Good night and hit them straight.